Get started now. Yeah. Thank you and uh, welcome to another episode of the Jane Irrigation Training Series. I'm Richard Restuccia, your host. And today we're going to be talking about something that uh, is becoming more important to all of us as landfills fill up and laws across the United States change, uh, and that is composting. And uh, I love this title, Is There a Right Way? Because, um, you know, I think for a lot of people, they feel that composting is really complicated and that they can mess it up. And if you do it the wrong way, it's going to hurt uh, your plants or hurt your landscape or there's going to be bad smells. And uh, so I thought it was really important, considering everything that's going on, here we are at the start of spring, that uh, we bring Laura Wilkinson on today. She is a master composter. And when I hear master in front of any other title, you know, I think that means it's a complicated subject. But in talking to Laura, the thing I really appreciated about her, is she makes this simple. She makes it something, composting, something that we could do. We can start this afternoon if you're not already doing it. And uh, she teaches it in a way that's really uh, easy to understand and, uh, and makes you want to go out there and do it. So, uh, Laura, welcome and, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, composting, so, oh, you were, you were going to say, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say, how complicated is this? Is it a really complicated process? It is not. It is, I mean, you know, you hear the wax on, wax off. It's garbage in, garbage disintegrating. It's pretty much that simple. Home composting is really an effective and efficient way to dramatically reduce your waste stream at home. And while you're doing that, you're also doing your part to reduce your carbon footprint because organic material that's sent to landfill creates methane, as you know, a powerful greenhouse gas. And that contributes obviously to the negative impacts of our changing climate. But by making compost, you're creating a valuable soil amendment. And you can use that to benefit your own landscape and your gardens. You can boost plant growth and sequester carbon at the same time. So you're, you're hitting all sorts of, of, uh, of targets at the same time. Many times uh, you find that food waste and yard waste can be composted at home. And that even includes grass clippings um, as long as they're dried out. It's your tree and shrub trimmings, uh, your vegetable garden and fruit tree waste, lawn clippings of all kinds, uh, autumn leaves, for example, coffee grounds, tea bags, and all the fruit and vegetable scraps from your kitchen. And that includes everything from moldy bread to the lettuce that stays a little bit too long in that bag in your refrigerator. So all of those scraps can be used for composting. And, and home composters, just so you know, should never attempt to compost meat, dairy, or large amounts of baked goods that have a lot of fats and sometimes animal fats in them. And that's because of biopathogens, but we'll get to that in a little bit. The key is really to blend your feedstocks and achieve a balance of carbon and nitrogen, keeping things damp but not saturated and ensure an adequate oxygen supply deep into the pile. And really the microbes just do the rest of it for you. So it's, it's challenging, right, for me to see gardeners um, uh, have green waste hauled off to the dump and then turn around and drive to the local big box store and buy compost or mulch. <laughs> and I exactly. think, oh my gosh, what are they doing? Exactly. <laughs> so if you're wondering what, what, what composting really is, it's trash. It's just garbage. Um, compost makes for soil conservation and healthier soils, less, less toxic environments too, and less toxic gardening because compost works both as a natural fertilizer and it's also a natural disease repellent, which most people don't know, because it's the balance of fungus, bugs, and invertebrates or worms that, that get into this. Um, composting not only helps avert the greenhouse gases that are accelerating climate change, but it actually is a carbon sink and can recapture carbon for you. So if we dive in a little further, there's really only, only four items necessary for composting success. First is you want to have your browns or carbon, and those are dried leaves, sawdust, shredded paper, straw. Those are tissues that you blow your nose in. I know it sounds gross, but it will compost. You'll be amazed at how quickly it disintegrates. Dog hair, even yes, your own hair, um, you can even, if you have wool rugs, not poly, you know, and not plastic rugs, but if you have wool rugs you, or cotton rugs, you can even dump your vacuum cleaner stuff into it as well. The greens are the big parts. That's nitrogen. Those are your vegetables, fruits, bread, grains, eggshells are included, tea bags, coffee grounds, and several other items in there. And then of course you need air because all living things need oxygen to survive and water because they all need water to survive as well. 
So those are really the only four ingredients that you need to put in there in somewhat of a balance as you get started. There are various types of uh, composting containers that you can use. Um, but, you know, there's like, this is a barrel one. If you live on a, let's say a patio apartment on the 16th floor and you want to compost, this is what you use. It doesn't touch the ground. So you have to turn it. You have to crank it a little bit. It can take a little bit longer than other types too. And um, it's a barrel type composter. They make it pretty easy to turn them though. So you can dump a lot of stuff in there and crank it. And then, you know, six to three months, six weeks to three months, you have serious compost there that if you're on that 16th floor of a patio apartment, you can use for your house plants, for example. Um, so, a wooden, yeah. Laura, we, we have a couple of questions coming in. Oh, okay. And, uh, I, I wanted to touch on those. I did want to remind Please. everybody, we've got the question, the Q&A open in the chat. And remember, we're giving free James swag to people who ask the good questions. And uh, I don't think we've had a bad question yet. So that's a hint where everyone's a winner. But um, so Laura, you said six weeks to three months, I can actually have a, a, a compost product. With that, with that barrel, yes. Some will even, some of the methods I'll show you here will work even faster than that, some slower. But that's for that particular barrel, that's about how long it takes. Yeah, and so then when I get my product, when I get the compost, I just spread that under my plants. What do I, what do I do with it? Um, you can use it as a mulch. You can blend it into soil. You can sprinkle it on top of your house plants because it brings nutrients in it. Um, you can use it. Compost is really an enhanced um, fertilizer for your soils, whatever soils you use, whether it's house plants or whether it's garden plants, or even if it's, you know, your shrubs or your roses out front. So you can use it as a soil amendment, or you can use it, um, you know, as a topping in there and, and water it in. It's really, just think of it as a fertilizer, really. Yeah. Okay. It, also, okay. it also retains a ton of water, which is really important. Um, I do have a couple of stats uh, in some later slides to, that speak to that, how much water it retains. So your water use goes down when you use more compost too. We had somebody else asking too, are you going to touch on compost teas at some point in the presentation? Yes, yes, I will. Okay, great. We'll get through there. Um, this is another type of compost that you can use. It's a wooden bin. It's cheap and easy. All you need is a wood and a drill and it aerates through the slats. Um, just so you know, most of what I'm talking about today is what they call aerobic composting. So it has access to air. We'll, I'll touch upon anaerobic, which is what some of the big waste management companies are doing um, in a little bit. But this is aerobic, so you want to make sure there's enough air there. And you want to turn the soil to make sure that you get air throughout it. And you can see this one looks a little bit dry. It, can use, it has some leaves on top and such. But you want to keep it a certain moisture, um, kind of like a wrung out sponge. You want to be able to pick it up. And if you squeeze it, a couple of drops come out. You don't want it soggy because then it can get slimy, but uh, you do want it to, to definitely um, get a lot of air and a certain amount of water. Um, just so you know, Starbucks, everybody knows Starbucks, right? Um, they even bag up their used coffee upon request. So if, you, if you're looking for different supplies and different food stocks, everything from horse manure to Starbucks coffee can be used in composting. They're great composting ingredients. The couple of things you never want to put in there is cat poop or dog poop because they're meat eaters. So no meat can be included because of the biopathogens, e, e. coli and salmonella concerns. But uh, the best ones are, are really a mixture. You want to get a mix. You don't want to feed them just banana peels um, because the microbes, you know, different microbes like different, different foodstuffs. And that just like us, they like a variety. They don't want to eat the same thing all the time. So um, this is actually, it's kind of a lousy shot, but it, you'll see other pictures of it. This is my favorite bin to use, uh, the one back here. It, it's actually a three by three by three. And at the bottom, you can see it has a little door that you can open up. So as it, as it disintegrates over time, you can pull the compost out of the bottom and then add more feedstuffs up at the top there. So that's how that kind of works. Yeah. Um, or we've got another question coming in. And, yes. Uh, somebody is asking, I've got raccoons and apparently coyotes in my neighborhood. Uh -huh. Are they going to get in my bin? Is that going to cause a problem? No, you'll see how, how we set this up. This particular bin is, I live in Coronado, California, where we have the biggest rat problem in the world. We make New York City look like nothing. The rats <laughs> love us. It doesn't matter, doesn't matter how big your house is or how expensive it is, the rats are here. 
Um, the but they, Coronado they cannot... Chamber of Commerce is calling Correct. on the other mind. <laughs> I'm sure they are. Like, <laughs> shut up. Um, but uh, the thing about this particular bin is it's such a thick, it's a recycled plastic, which is great, but it's so thick. They get, rodents can't get in this. They cannot get in it. Honestly, raccoons can't open it because of the turns. You'll see as we, I'm going to show you a video as how we set this very one up. So this is a good one um, to use as well. But really, all you need is a bin. All you need is a plastic bin. If you drill holes in it uh, about two inches apart all the way around, that's plenty of aeration. Um, and you can just dump it in there and mix it up and put, make sure and drill holes in the top too. And that's all you really need. You don't need this fancy expensive stuff, but if you want to get, you know, if you want to get your, your, um, feet wet as it were, and, and dive in, uh, the, a bin's a great way to do it because I'm sure we all have some plastic bins sitting around or even those five gallon paint buckets that you get at Home Depot, Lowe's and everywhere else. Those work too. So you can use those. You can even dump them in the ground if you'd like, and that makes it even faster. So this is Coronado High School. Um, we were actually setting up a bin here and um, you can see we pulled it out of the cardboard box and they're putting it together. They're reading the manual and they're actually ripping up the cardboard box to use as the Browns within it. So it's a zero waste kind of um, item that we have working here. They're putting the top together there and you can see on the top, they actually have turn handles, which locks it down, which keeps any raccoons or any critters that have opposing thumbs um, outside of humans who know how to open it to be able to do that. So that's how that one works. Um, we'll go to the next slide here. Yeah, that's so uh, filling. Yes. Yeah, pretty, pretty. It's a great illustration. Pretty easy to put together, and uh, I mean, didn't take very much time at all, did it? No, it didn't. It took maybe about 10 minutes. I think that's, you know, I do it. I'm not going to make you sit through a 10 minute one, but um, that's, <laughs> that's pretty much how we put it together. Now, if you look, we have hardware, what's called hardware cloth underneath it. And we give it enough room so we can move, pick up the bin and move it to the side to turn the bin into that. We'll show you another video of that in just a minute. But the hardware cloth keeps the rodents from tunneling underneath and getting inside of the bin from underneath because those clever gophers and rats love to tunnel into any of that. But the hardware cloth, you know, they sell that at all the hardware stores, Dixie Line, Lowe's, Home Depot, all of them. And, uh, you know, it's pretty easy. It's cheap and it's easy to lay out and uh, it keeps them from getting underneath. So that's, that really, this is why I like this bin in particular is because the rodents just can't get to it. So when you're filling the bin, this, this type of bin, which is one of my favorite ways to do it, you layer your compost ingredients, starting with the brown. So you can put straw or you know some leaves at the bottom. Then you layer about three to five inches of the greens, which is your everything from potato peels and banana peels to um, you know tea bags and coffee grounds. And then another three to five inches of browns. And then you layer it all the way to the top, making sure there's some space for air in between. You water it down so it's damp, not soggy. And this is really important to put a top layer of browns on there to keep the fruit flies to a minimum. So you can see how we're doing it. We're using shredded paper here as the browns because there's so much of that, obviously at school systems. Um, this is our community garden we have at the local high school and elementary school here in Coronado that I helped them fill up. Um, now you see it's about halfway through and I'm like, no, we gotta put more in there, pull it off, put more in there, stir it up, there we go. So what, what you'll see is in just about two to three to maybe four days at the most, it'll that full bin will actually go down to about half. It'll disintegrate that quickly. So if we leave it alone, there's my straight out of compost t-shirt too, for all of you who are straight out of Compton fans. Um, here's another one that we have that we did at a low income housing apartment building. Literally, this is the only patch of dirt and it's on the ground floor. And so we set it up there because you really want the, you really want to be attached to the earth if you can, because the number of microbes that live in dirt that we can't see that are so efficient for making this happen are really something. So um, this is an example there. You can see here, um, I don't know if you guys can see the little hand on my screen, but this is um, a kitchen caddy that people take and put in their apartments. And then they collect their, uh, their food waste here to bring down and put into it. So we can show this um, camera, this unfortunate camera angle, but it kind of shows how we set it all up from the beginning. So this is filling another bin. We're using their kitchen caddies. Um, we weigh them because that way you can measure in terms of food waste, how much you're diverting in greenhouse gases. So we actually use a, 
um, a suitcase measuring scale, you know, one of those handheld suitcase measuring scales. And then we weigh each one of them and, and tally it up to see how much we're diverting from the landfill. So that's how we're doing it from a measurement standpoint here. Um, here's another one that another low income housing one, but this one, we're gonna show you how we turn the bin. So this bin has been filled and we're coming back three days later. And what we'll do is we'll pick up this bin, move it on the other part of the hardware cloth and then um, turn it with a fork or pitchforks actually. You can see we have, this is a low income senior housing and they're really terrific. Even the people in um, who have mobility challenges come down and help us chop up things and make it happen. So you could see this is disintegrate. That was all garbage. And it, you could see how much is disintegrated already. We turn it and then we add more to it. And then we put the straw on top because that keeps the fruit flies and any kind of bugs from, from uh, really overwhelming it. And one of the questions we get too is, does it smell? And the fact, I mean, the truth is it does not. If you're doing it right, it does not. If you get it too wet, it can get slimy and smell, but then you just add more browns to the mix, mix it up. And in about a day, it's back to normal. So th this is another bin that's filled. Um, you have to have enough mass to heat it up. The microbes will actually heat this up between 120 and 160 degrees. Sometimes I use a thermometer to teach them, you know, the temperature in there. Other times they just get to see when you're turning it, it's very steamy which is really um, amazing to them. They're like, how does it get so hot? But that is really the microbes that are breaking down all of the nutrients in there. And when we fill up the bin like this, we have to call in the FBI immediately. And that's the fungus, bacteria, and invertebrates that are gonna be doing it. So you fill it to the top for the optimum composting work by the FBI. And then what you get is beautiful compost. This is uh, after six weeks, we turned it about every two to three or every three to four days at this particular location. And this is the beautiful stuff that you buy at the Home Depot garden centers for you know 10 bucks. It takes five to six weeks in a bin this large if you have a variety of different scraps, longer if you don't turn it as often, if you wanna be lazy, and sometimes I am, I just let it sit and disintegrate on its own but it's incredibly healthy soil. There's no chemicals in there. There's no harmful ingredients. Um, if you put a Chiquita banana peel in there, you'll see the Chiquita sticker <laughs> sticking out and you just, you filter through this to pull out any accidental plastics or any big chunks. And then you have this beautiful compost. And a few facts about composting and water conservation, which I know is really important to the Jane audience is, if you're wondering how effective it is in holding water, a 1994 study by A. Maynard found that a three inch layer of leaf compost rototilled to a six inch depth increased water holding capacity 2.5 times that of the native sandy soil. And it provided almost a seven day supply of plant available water just by turning it into the soil. So um, that's do we a have pretty any... amazing statistic. Yeah, Thank yeah you. it is. So, um, you know, composting and it can be done on on major levels, which we'll cover in a bit. Do we have any questions th uh, at this point? Because I'm I'm watching my screen and making sure that, you know, no, I don't want to pop couple questions. In coming okay. in. So the turning it, this is really all you're doing is taking what's on the bottom and putting it on the top, right? Is this, is this right? Is that how you turn it? Um, actually, you pull the bin up and it, you have this square block and you literally just, yeah, you just turn it. You don't have to put the bottom at the top. You just turn it from the center and, you know, the, the bottom stuff winds up on the top anyway. Um, but you just use a pitchfork and a couple of shovels and you turn it. And again, with composting, it's, it's kind of like jazz. Um, you find what works for you and there's no perfect way to do it. And some is better than other for you, but, but you find what you like to do and what kind of composting works for you. And, uh, and that's what you're likely to stick with. So well, when it's, when it's cooking, do you add more stuff to it or do you let it cook and you start a different pile? You can you, and again, the answer to both is yes. Yes. You can do both. Um, we have had those that just wanted to see the bin all, it's much faster if you don't add to it. But if you turn it a couple of times and it's, you know, you have a full bin to start, it goes down to about half and then to a third. And what you can do is you can add a bunch of stuff at the top and then take the third out of the bottom because there's a little slide door at the bottom of it that you could just pull the compost out of the bottom. Yeah. Okay, cool. So that's, that's one of the great ways to do it. Now, if you're a master gardener, what are you looking, you know, what, what are the things that you're looking for? Um, this is, uh, vermiculture is something that I do as well. Um, I have worm bins. 
And people think, ew, isn't it gross? Well, actually, this is one of my favorites, the sub pod. Um, and this is, I don't know where they're manufactured. I think they're manufactured out of Australia. But this is a really interesting one. And I use this a lot because it's really great for little kids. Um, this is something that you literally dump into the soil and it's already aerated and it's aerated at the top. You never fill it, you know, you start here and then add your worms, but, but I can show you what this looks like. When you open the top, it has the steps right here. So it tells you here are your nitrogen food scraps, here are your carbon scraps, you water and aerate. So the directions are on the underside of the lid for anybody who's a beginner. And really, and this, I use this at nursery schools a lot because they're learning how to read and it kind of shows them how to add the food scraps, add the dry carbon paper, aerate through all, moisten, you lay the blanket, which is made out of coconut core on top of it. And it tells you how much to add per week so you don't kill the little darlings. Um, this is what you feed them. You cut or tear into small pieces because large chunks don't do well. It takes them longer. And, you know, if I throw in a whole banana that's rotten, they'll love it and they'll jump on it. it. Takes you know, it takes a little longer for them to break it down. But it says no thanks to remind you: don't put in non-organics. Don't throw in you know cigarette butts or any plastics or glass or anything that's not organic. Um, but you can use you know the toilet paper rolls, tissues, egg cartons, toilet rolls, cardboard of all kinds. Your Amazon boxes will keep them fed. I'm sure for generations to come. Um, dry leaves or grass clippings. And then you can put a little bit of this in, but they don't really like it. They don't, you know, we don't, after the level two is full, you can put in, I don't ever put fish, seafood, meats, or bones in there. Um, oils, dairy, and cheese. They tend not to like citrus. So I tend not to put any citrus in. You know, if you have, let's say you've made rice and it's gone bad in your refrigerator, but you, you, you made it with oil and onions and garlic, that's something you can do too. You could put rice, you could put oatmeal, you know, anything, moldy bread they love, you know, they love mushrooms. You know, if you have mushrooms that go bad, they love mushrooms because it's fungus, it's already, already there. And just so you know, the, the vermiculture worms are usually red wigglers. Um, my neighbors like to come steal some when they go fishing, <laughs> which is pretty funny. Um, but they my, my eat worms, my worms really love avocado skins. Oh, I do know they? That. Yeah, really? that's like a big party for them when that happens. That's a great one. That's yeah. a great way to go. Yeah. So we have, I feed mine weekly or so, and uh, I'll show you how we make worm tea too. This is my little kitchen caddy that I have there. And, it's a, and a, this is my sub pod. I have it sunk into a little, um, you know, a, a little container so it ha they can escape if it gets too wet or they can climb back in if it gets too dry or whatever. And then these two are just uh, plastic jugs from white vinegar that I make worm tea out of by taking just a little bit of it. So I'll show you what we do. Um, I just kind of stir it up in there. You can see some mushrooms in there, eggshells, mix it up, aerate it. I take a little bit of coconut core to put in there to mix it up with some browns, or you can use shredded paper or leaves, whatever you have. I water it down a little bit. And then I put about a tablespoon of the um, vermiculture, you know, the, the worm compost to put in that and filled it up. And making worm tea, you know, is it's as different as, uh, I guess, cooking eggs, how you like your eggs. Some people think that you have to get, you know, you have to go buy nylon stockings and make a little tea bag and then dunk it in there and, you know, make sure it works. I just put it in there, fill it up with water, let it sit for 24 hours, shake it. And then you can dilute it one to 10, um, depending on the time of year. Sometimes I pour it straight on, on fig trees and guava trees um, when they're, when they're getting ready to bloom, but it's a great fertilizer. And it's also a natural insecticide as well. So worm tea is pretty easy to make. I mean, literally it's just, you put a little bit of the, the worm, uh, compost in a container like that and fill it with water. I try to pull the worms out so they don't meet a watery death, but you know, they're worms, they reproduce really quickly. So I'm not too concerned about it, but they are, uh, they re reproduce quickly and they really, they really are tolerant. Um, and you don't have to feed them weekly either. I mean, they can last for months there. You know, I wouldn't say too many months because you may lose some, but they do very well. So um, it's, it's not like a pet that you have to maintain. It's not a daily thing. So all right, no. backing up the questions here, uh, one, uh, one person is asking, uh, is there any concern of using raw materials that have had chemical treatments or, you know, ink on them? Is that going to pollute the compost? 
No, ink, um, you know, ink is such, it, it would be such a minute amount. And keep in mind too, you know, mushrooms, these, these microbes break down the very base of everything. You know, they break down mercury, they break down everything. So um, I would not, be, I use any kind of um, paper shredding, I wouldn't worry about. You want to stay away from, if you can, the highly glossy magazines because they're coated with plastic and worms do not eat plastic, that's non-organic. But any kind of paper, if it's printed on there, I would not be concerned about the ink or anything else like that. Does that answer the question? Yeah, and how about how about uh, plant material that's been treated with some type of chemical, uh, herbicide or? That's a great question. Um, depends on how heavily, you know, if it was treated with herbicide and it's been watered or it's rained, most of it is washed off into the watershed. Um, and this is a great way to go. Instead of trading it with herbicide, you can trade it with worm tea. Um, but for the most part, no. I mean, keep in mind, they're gonna, you're getting a lot of scraps and, uh, you know, breads and things like that that are manufactured and also have different chemicals in them. So as long as it's not large amounts um, and your feed stocks are fairly well balanced, you're going to be fine. Okay. And somebody else is doing a little turf removal at their house. And mm -hmm. uh, so they're digging grass plus a lot of soil. Um, is this something that can be composted? And is there any, any way to speed that process of the breakdown? Yes. Um, one of the ways uh, that people with large lots who have to compost, um, let's say you have a large farm or a ranch, you can actually just dig a ditch and throw it in there and, uh, and it will disintegrate on its own. It really well. It takes longer because you don't have, you know, this isn't a vermiculture thing. Um, I think that's just a composting thing. But instead of putting it into a green waste bin or throwing it away to go to a landfill, you can actually, if you're tearing up the turf, you can just kind of throw it in a pile and let it disintegrate. And believe it or not, if you've ever done that, you've left a pile of leaves over a winter, you know, you, you, you go back in the spring and you're like, wow, this thing, this thing is only three inches big and it was six feet when, when I started. Um, but that's part of the disintegration process as part of, um, you know, part of the whole cycle. You know, they break it down, builds up, break it down, build up. It's um, part of that, that circle that makes yeah. it work. Okay. Does that, that's a great question though. Yeah. Okay. And then somebody else was asking, they missed the beginning. We send a copy, a link of the uh, recording to everybody after. So uh, you'll definitely get the beginning. And um, uh, so somebody else is asking too about any special recommendations for composting with kids. Uh, she's working with 21 schools and their gardens and uh, they wanna get the curriculum to all the kids. Uh, what, what's been your experience there, Laura? What, what's really worked for you? I work with the Logan Heights Development Center, which is a very large low-income nursery school here. Um, and I have found with kids, it's great to do composting of any kind, but what I found is vermiculture really connects them because worms are living things. And even if they have an aversion to them to start, they love them afterwards. I, had neighbor, I have neighborhood kids who come over and check on the worms all the time. They would not do that if I just had a plain old compost pile. They like, because they're living things. I think if you're engaging children under the age of maybe, you know, 13, 12, um, you know, once they're preteens, they have the cognitive abilities to understand that. And from a scientific standpoint, from a school standpoint, they understand it. But I think with little kids, I find vermiculture is the best way to do it. Do a worm bin if you can, because then they'll be engaged and they'll, they'll know what to feed them and learn what to feed them. And they'll see some pretty immediate results. I mean, I dump in, you know, a couple of quarts of what looks like slimy garbage and my worm bin smell, I mean, it smells so loamy and earthy all the time. You just, you know, you mix it in and they eat it up and, and then, you know, you show them this is what the, this is the soil that comes from that. This is part of our, our, our ecosystem. So, and then yeah. you can make worm tea and you could, you'd be astonished at what it does to a local garden. So. I think that's such a great suggestion because, you know, I'm a few years out of elementary school, but I still, you know, I'm like, <laughs> I want to, oh, I got to check on the worms. How are the worms right. doing, right? It keeps me engaged and it keeps me composting because I'm taking care of the worms too. I feel that responsibility. I, I, that's a great idea for kids, I think. Yeah, it's that's that's been my go-to for kids for all of the um, elementary school kids and for all of the nursery schools that I deal with. That really engages them. And, you know, you can start small. And again, you don't have to have a sub pod. You can just start with a plastic, 
a couple of plastic bins. So, and I'll make sure and drop my email and information in the chat as well, or, or Richard will to make sure that if you have any questions, you can contact me afterwards too. And I can, I'm happy to make suggestions. You know, this is, this is a passion of mine and I love it. And I think if everybody did it, well, we'll find out in just a little bit about what that looks like. So kitchen caddies are a great way to collect food scraps. Um, you're wondering, how do I get it to the worm bin? How do I get it to my compost pile? You know, I don't want to sort my garbage. Well, if you keep a kitchen caddy right by your um, sink, you'll find that all the scraps can go in there. And when you empty your uh, refrigerator, when you clean out your refrigerator and find the science projects in there, those are the very things that your compost pile loves. So um, Edco and waste management companies usually have these kind of kitchen caddies for free, um, depending on the location where you are, but you can usually find them online fairly inexpensively too. And the one I use actually has a little carbon filter in it, which keeps any smells from happening. It's best to, you don't want to line them with plastic because that really defeats the whole purpose. Plastic is not allowed in your compost bin, um, but you can line it with a paper bag or with old newspaper or um, you know, any of the, your old mail, to be honest with you, a lot of that, that, that comes through, by the way, all of your junk mail can go in there as long as it's not extremely plastic coated. And, um, you want to take the little plastic window, you know, when you're getting a bill and it has the plastic window that has your utility company, just tear the plastic part out, or even if you shred it and put it in there, you know, you'll see it at the end in the compost and be able to pick it out along with your Chiquita banana peel um, labels that you neglected to remove before you put them in the compost pile because that happens a lot. Um, you can also put these uh, these bins in the freezer too if you're concerned about fruit flies or get grossed out by moldy bread on you know in this. Um, I know so a lot of people put it in their freezer and then they're astonished at how much food waste. If you just do that for a week, you'll be astonished at how much food you throw away. And you'll be even more astonished if you walk into the back of your grocery store and see what they throw away because of cosmetic reasons. It's, it's horrifying how much food waste there is. And it's estimated to be almost a third of our greenhouse gas emissions, um, what our, our waste in our food chain from restaurants to supermarkets to what we throw away individually. About a third of our food is thrown away which is crazy. So according to the Stop Waste Partnership Greenhouse Gas Calculator, which is a really great way for lay people like me or you to determine, am I gonna make any impact at all with composting, whether with my company or whether with me individually? Well, yes, you can actually measure it. And all of you engineers out there and, and management types and finance types know that if you can't measure it, you cannot manage it. So Stop Waste Partnership came out with a greenhouse gas calculator. So you can actually enter your inputs of how much you give away. Let's say you do, you know, half a ton with four families over the course. And it, believe you me, it's, you don't think, you think that's a oh, half a ton. I would never throw that away. I guarantee you, you'll be shocked at how the volume of weight that you throw away all the time, because a lot of it's water too, you know, I mean, even watermelon rinds count as that. But if only 10 of you start composting by the end of this year, your impact on emissions is equivalent to reducing and, and recapturing enough carbon equivalent to take between 10 and 20 gasoline cars off the road for an entire year. Now think about that. If you can offset your car's emissions by just doing composting in your own backyard, what would that do if all of us did that? Right. So um, there is the website is www.stopwaste.org. Um, that's the overview one, but the, the link to the actual calculator, um, I will make sure that Richard either drops in the chat. Uh, Richard, you may be able to see it. I don't know if you can. I could drop it in the chat, but you're, you're looking at my screen, so I don't want to mess it up. But I'll do it. I'll do it in the chat at the end if that works for everybody. Yeah, we can um, also a, put it on the uh, the email that we'll send out to everybody. Oh, here. that's perfect. That's perfect. We'll yeah, put it, we'll that put it there perfect. along with your contact information. That would be perfect. So, so you can actually measure it. You can actually manage it. Uh, you can actually do it either in a neighborhood or you can do it with a company or um, even your municipality. You'd be astonished at how many municipalities have climate action plans now and composting either is or isn't part of it. Um, in Southern California, there are many municipalities and the state of California, of course, has great grants for composting because the fact of the matter is we're running out of landfills. 
So here are the facts. Composting is easy and it's free. It's the garbage you're already throwing away. You're just putting it in a different place. It reduces waste in our landfills, which in my neck of the woods will be entirely full by 2025. And land is expensive in San Diego. So, you know, using it to dump garbage when we can actually put it back into our soils, get carbon capture and retain water in the soil in a drought part of California, this is really something. So you'll see many cities in California and other urban areas will be out of these landfills um, in just a couple of years. It reduces methane from landfills. Our backyard composting is aerobic and it is a carbon sink. It does replenish our local soils and that helps avoid runoff into our bays, into our oceans, into our rivers, into all of our watersheds, which all of us share and, and pull water out of. And it does create spectacular gardens, um, it, it, no doubt. I have a dwarf uh, navel orange tree in my backyard and I'm in a part of Coronado too. I'm like really close to the ocean and bay. So it's kind of like gardening on a boat. It's, I have so much salt air here, but I have this dwarf navel orange that last year threw off 24, almost football sized navel oranges. And it's not a dwarf anymore. It's a huge orange tree. So, and that's from warm tea and compost, honestly. Um, your city and your organization needs to adopt backyard composting as part of its climate action plan. And if you as a citizen suggest it to your city or municipality, you'd be stunned how many people will go, oh, I never even thought of that. And the backyard composting is where they literally subsidize, uh, the County of San Diego subsidizes those big bins that I showed you, the rat proof ones. They subsidize those so you can get a voucher for $100 to go buy one at a local store. That is a local, um, garden that we that I donate worm tea and compost to and they keep it as a rock garden and as you can see it is absolutely spectacular. That is fabulous. The thing that really is astounding is the colors that are there and oh, that's yeah. what I noticed that worm tea does so well to all the blossoms. They're deeper uh, and they're brighter and uh, it makes a big difference. Um, we had another exactly. question coming in about uh, uh, vermicomposting. Um, sometimes uh, this person gets a few ants in that bin. Is there a way to deal with ants or is that just part of the game? Ants are part of the game. Um, I'm surprised because we have ants here like crazy, um, but they have not gotten to my compost bin. I, I find that. But they're, you know, they're, they're, they're creatures and they're going to help break it down. Um, yeah. They may... Decide, you know, I would keep turning your compost because that that keeps them from nesting in there. If they let, you know, there are some ground ants that that really like compost because why not? It's a food source. Um, you know, you're living in your own food source. It's great. But I would uh, as long as you're turning the compost, um, you know, then they're helpful and not taking up shop. So. I think that's a great part of it. So any creatures, you know, remember you have the FBI, you have, you have fungus, bacteria, and invertebrates, and then you have vertebrates as well. Um, well the eggshells are, are something that ants, anything with an exoskeleton will break down your eggshells too. So they like the calcium in it. Yeah, so to my roses. So um, <laughs> another, another question about the uh, new law on mandate for green recycling and composting here in California. Do you have any, can you make any comments on that? Sure. Um, we have, there are different waste management companies that have what they call anaerobic composting. And I know waste management pioneered this years ago in Florida. And what they do is they take their landfill um, there are certain things they keep, they collect green waste in a separate bin. And by green waste, that means any organics. That means you can throw in, you know, T-bones from your steak from the night before. You can throw in all those things with biopathogens because they actually cover it and then they heat it to a very, very high temperature, which kills all the biopathogens. And then that produces methane, which they recapture and they filter and they use the methane to power their trucks. So it's a great, it's a great way to capture a lot of the waste, the greenhouse gases that would normally go into the atmosphere and accelerate climate change and uh, global warming. But 
the, the fact of the matter is they recapture that methane now, power their trucks with it, and then they're left with compost at the end. So you can drive to EDCO or you can drive to waste management and you know they have days where you can come with your own truck and shovel it into your truck. But I'm too lazy to do that. I just prefer to do the compost where it's right in my own backyard and I can use it right away. Well, and you but there are the many- yeah, you save the gas too. But but it's great that waste management and that Edco are making these kind of investments. Um, I think they're kind of forced to by public policy, and uh, but it's great that they're doing it because it's really critical. It, you know, we have so many people that throw away so much. We don't know how much we throw away because it's carried away all the time. If um, if you've ever had a garbage strike, you know, if you've ever had sanitation workers go on strike, you become acutely aware of how much you throw away. And what we want to get to is more of a zero waste kind of situation, you know, instead of buying plastic water bottles, which by the way, those companies do not make water, they make plastic bottles, that's all they do. Um, make sure and get a reusable water bottle. And, you know, all airports and most public places now have places where you can fill them. That's a very small thing that you can do individually if composting seems like too much. Um, buy bar soap instead of, you know, the plastic pump things. I mean, those are things that we don't think about until we're forced to look at the amount of garbage that we throw away and the amount of plastics, which, by the way, are not recyclable. They're only recyclable once or twice, and there has to be a market for it. And as we know, uh, China has eliminated the, about 90 percent of their recyclables market from the United States. So most of those plastic bottles that you think are recyclable are winding up in a landfill. So. Yeah, and this this new green waste law in California, it really mm -hmm. says that you can't even throw your grass clippings in your regular trash bin, right? They they want to move Correct. it. They want the, 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 they want to move it to a green bin, and that is for this anaerobic composting, because that way they can they take that as a separate part of the truck, and then they put it in their anaerobic composter. Now you can't put plastics in the anaerobic composter or composter, so. That's why they want the green waste to be separate. And they're, they're rolling it out in California, they're rolling it out in different municipalities over the course of a year, but they're gonna be very, very strict about it. And um, you, know, you can get fined, I think at some point, if you, if you pollute things, you know, if, if people throw dirty diapers in the green composting bin, that's not gonna work. If they, um, you know, the plastics that are gonna be recycling need to be in the recycle bin, if they're going to be recycled at all, and the green waste will go in, and it's a, it's a matter of retraining. You know, we've done it this way for a long time. We need to retrain ourselves because the old way is not working in the long term. Our grandchildren, you know, I have a grandson who is a year old, and in 2070, you know, he's he's going to be 50. He's going to be close to 50 years old. What kind of world am I leaving for him if we keep living the same way? Because we know what's happening now. You know, sea yeah, level rise is real. Miami's in trouble. We, we know the storms are greater. We're going to have some real issues to deal with as a world, as a planet. And if we, you know, it's really overwhelming to think about when you think climate change, what can I do? You know, I can't make a difference, but actually you can, you can. And it's something as simple as composting makes a huge difference, a huge difference. Yes. Simple. Uh, make, thanks to you. We learned today how simple it is. It does make a huge difference, and it's um, it's something most of us uh, are, are doing already in one shape or form, and uh, it just changes this habit a little bit, and uh, and we can do it uh, at our homes very easily. So, okay, great. Here's all your contact information. It's okay for people to reach out if they have additional questions. Of course, please do. Please do. All right. Um, Bokashi is a t you had mentioned that before. Somebody had mentioned about Bokashi. Um, composting. And Bokashi is actually an additive that you put to uh, things in a, not so much in a compost bin, it's a separate thing, but Bokashi is not exactly composting, it's actually fermenting. And it has microbes and bran and molasses in it. And it's something that you add to your garbage. Let's say all of this on the screen is in you know, in a certain bin, and then you seal it up and it actually ferments it. It doesn't turn it into compost, but it it is kind of a an additive that you can put to your compost if you'd like, um, but it makes it, you know, it's very rapid. It happens, you know, it happens in just a couple of days as opposed to several weeks. So um, that's what Bokashi is. Now you also may have seen, they sell these little, um, they're countertop composters that heat and supposedly you can put, re, you know, compostable plastics in them. I've seen the ad, it's very much like, you know, baking a cake in 30 seconds. 
um, on TV. It looks really good, but the fact of the matter is they don't work as well as, um, as purported. And it's an electronic appliance that you'd have to buy and you'd use energy to do composting where you really could just let the earth do the work itself if you're patient. We are the Federal Express generation. So we want everything you know, overnight by 8 a.m. no matter what. Um, but if we can be patient a little bit with the earth, then the earth will be patient with us and you can yeah. get composting that way too. Yeah, what a great message to leave everybody with, Laura. Thank you so much. I really thank appreciate you. your time and all this information. And to all the viewers out there, thank you for spending a little bit of your time, uh, your day with us uh, during this time. We really appreciate it. And please remember all the webinars are at the janesusa.com forward slash trainings page. You can see all of them there or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast too. Uh, or thanks again. I really appreciate it. I uh, look forward to seeing everybody back on Friday where we're going to be talking about uh, ag tech uh, and irrigation and what the future holds on that. So uh, again, thank you, Laura. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. Thank you. Bye.